matter for the United States, the global fight. And we see uh, corrupt regimes, including Russia, the uh, uh, regime led by uh, President Vladimir Putin, a, a corrupt regime waging war on its neighbors. And so there's a, a, a link between corruption and conflict and U.S. interests. And that's why we're very pleased to have those uh, officials from other countries and today from Bosnia and Herzegovina who are invested precisely in the effort to fight against corruption. So I am very pleased to welcome you here and our online audience to this uh, special event with Sabina Chudic and Damir Aunat. Uh, they are both, let me uh, explain who they are. Uh, Damir, I'll start with Damir. He is a uh, member of parliament, of the national parliament of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, <clears throat> and Sabina is a member of the federal parliament. Bosnia-Herzegovina, for those of you who don't know, is, has a national level state uh, institutions. And it also has two entities, the Federation and Republika Srpska. And Sabina is a member of that federal parliament. And Damir is a member of the national parliament. And Damir spearheaded the work of a special committee in the national parliament that has done a deep dive into really the epicenter of uh, rule of law and the, the fight against corruption in any country, which is the judiciary. So without a, an effective judiciary, what kind of a, a fight can you have against corruption. And Damir uh, leading a mixed a group. And when we say mixed, people know Bosnia-Herzegovina is uh, divided, fought a very bitter war uh, uh, that ended in 1995 and has had a, a difficult roads since then, uh, achieving the vision of uh, re reestablishing a properly functioning government. And Damir led a committee that included senior uh, members of parliament from Republika Srpska, together diving in, exposing, exploring uh, the uh, elements of the weaknesses in the judiciary and coming up with concrete recommendations on how to tackle that. And their report, I'll close here just by saying the report has been widely recognized and applauded with, by uh, Bosnians and by foreign officials. And there was an event in Sarajevo that featured the U.S. Embassy, the EU, other uh, members of uh, major EU organizations. Uh, OSCE is also present there. And so without further introduction, I'm going to, Sabina will, will come in later, but we're going to open with Damir to explain the work of this uh, important committee. Please, Damir. You have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Ed, and uh, thank you all for uh, coming here and for tuning in online. Uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to to appear here at SAIS. It's a, it's, a, it's a real pleasure and an honor uh, to discuss this, this important issue that we've been discussing uh, in uh, Washington in our visits uh, with uh, State Department, NSC officials also uh, Congress people on the Hill, uh, I'm very pleased that there is a really enormous interest into this topic. Uh, it is precisely due to the fact that you described that the Biden administration has identified corruption as a national security issue, as a threat to stability of different regions in the world, but by extension of the United States as a whole. And uh, interest really has been enormous. Thank you also, Ed, for this extremely useful introduction about the particularities of Bosnia-Herzegovina, including its complex uh, system uh, of government, uh, different uh, levels of government. And uh, I'll focus on this issue specific related to the judiciary and the corruption and the work that the committee did. Uh, I'm sure that Sabina will talk about this other aspect, uh, which is also extremely important uh, for the future of Bosnia-Herzegovina, and that's that cross-entity, cross-ethnic cooperation. In fact, while it was my idea as a lawyer, to me it came as a second nature to set up this committee, investigative committee in parliament, to use this oversight power that our parliament has, which is basically modeled on the U.S. Congress uh, uh, oversight powers, 
uh, I completely relied on the strategy of Nasha Stranka, which is to build bridges uh, with different partners in Bosnia Herzegovina around themes of common interests, around themes that we agree on, uh, to further uh, the development of the country and to focus on those things uh, that are good for the country, such as fight against the corruption, uh, you know, uh, adopting laws uh, that are required uh, for European Union candidacy status and so on and so forth. And uh, seven of my colleagues and I, uh, three of them from Republika Srpska, five from the Federation, got together, uh, we decided to introduce a motion for the setting up of this investigative committee on judicial corruption, following uh, a leaked videotape of the former head of the Bosnia-Herzegovina judiciary engaging in, let to say the least, uh, completely inappropriate conduct, in other words, engaging in so soliciting a bribe. Well, uh, basically, his associate was later filmed as soliciting a bribe. Uh -huh. uh, he, he removed himself from that part of the conversation, but uh -huh. he certainly is on tape engaging in uh, inappropriate dealings with a party to a criminal proceeding. Uh, uh -huh. there, there's just no doubt what, what went on down there. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, it happened in a bar, in a dive, really, uh, dive bar. And I often say people in America will get it better in Bosnia, sort of, um, it flies over people's head. But uh, uh, I, I always tell this joke. Uh, it, it, I always say that it reminded me of that joke, uh, you know, uh, the head of the Judicial Council uh, a senior police officer and party to a criminal proceedings walk into a bar. <laughs> you can imagine what happened later. Uh, so that, that did lead to his downfall, but only uh, a year and a half after we had set up this committee, uh, there were enormous obstructions, uh, both from within the judiciary and from within uh, a lot of political circles to the setting up of this committee. And I had no doubt whatsoever from the beginning that the uh, obstructions were basically due to the fear of a lot of these people on what we're going to uncover. Uh, and the fear proved to be justified. The guy, the guy I was just mentioning uh, is gone uh, from the judicial sector. Uh, the former chief prosecutor is not only gone from her position for things that she admitted, the wrongdoings she admitted before the committee, but she was actually later put, as a result of the things she said before my committee, she was put on the, on the black list, on the, on the United States sanctions list, uh, because uh, the, the, the things she admitted before my committee were basically judged by the US administration uh, were sufficiently, uh, of sufficiently serious corrupt nature to warrant her placing on, the, on, this, uh, on this sanctions list. Uh, Gordana Tadic is the former chief prosecutor. Uh, I am extremely grateful to the U.S. and OSC support in particular from the moment that the committee was set up uh, to the present day. Uh, as you mentioned that last week, it was a, there was a really successful uh, conference in Syria in the parliament building attended by eight ambassadors, uh, U.S. ambassador in, particularly, in particular delivered a pointed speech about this being uh, an issue of extreme importance to the United States, welcoming the report, welcoming the report of the committee, and uh, also uh, recognizing the strategic value of this model of cooperation that I'll let Sabina uh, talk about later uh, for the future of Bosnia and Herzegovina, for uh, other uh, issues that, uh, that warrant attention and that are necessary on the EU uh, road. Uh, our report is, uh, extremely detailed, uh, but also us being politicians rather than bureaucrats, uh, uh, it allowed us a lot of leeway in uh, terms of being extremely direct, pointing out the specific cases of corruption that we uncovered in judiciary, and then also presenting a set of 15 recommendations with one of the most important one includes the required vetting of uh, top judicial officers, because one thing that we really uncovered, there was a common thread common theme, if you will, running through these uh, testimonies. Uh, we heard 35 witnesses from mostly from the judiciary and the common thread, the common theme was that the corruption isn't so much a problem on the lower levels of the judiciary, but that it is rampant at the upper levels, including the presidents of the court, the chief prosecutors, uh, the members of this high judicial and prosecutorial council, sort of the oversight body of, of, of the judiciary. Uh, and uh, we treat it as a national security interest. We treat it as an issue that threatens the stability of Bosnia and Herzegovina and by extension, the Balkans. Uh, we all know 
uh, that uh, instability in Bosnia and Herzegovina breeds instability elsewhere in the Balkans. Uh, and I'm particularly uh, comforted, so to speak, by the fact that the United States uh, views these issues in pretty much uh, the same light. Uh, I'll stop here and uh, we, can, we can then move on to these other, but we can, we can also come back to any of these uh, sure. issues. Um, I, I have lots of questions uh, for you, uh, Damir, about it, but I want to give the floor to Sabina to give her perspectives on this as well. Um, well, besides what Damir had said, uh, there is another aspect that I think it's it's kind of overlooked when we when we look into the work of of this committee and and its results. Um, I was 16 when I first came to the United States. I was a high school student, got a scholarship, and that's where I fell in love with politics. Um, and debate. The, <laughs> well, <wasn't> <laughs> I, yes, I was on the debate scholarship, and um, and I looked into. I mean, I was in high school, and I took government class, and it's the first time. This is right after the war. I was 10 when the war started, and 14 when it ended. Um, and I fell in love with the concept of checks and balances. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not a concept that we often studied or practiced uh, in former Yugoslavia. And, um, and, and I thought, wow, what a wonderful way to have three branches of government looking over each other and somehow making sure that the system, system works. And I think, um, in effect, the work of the committee um, almost introduces that concept in our state institutions. Uh, because again, there were even accusations that it's, it's actually uh, almost illegal that, uh, that the legislative body should be kind mm -hmm. of meddling into the mm -hmm. work of the judicial, judicial mm -hmm. system. That's how little we understand the concept mm -hmm. of checks and balances and what the parliament right. should be doing. Um, and, and I do have to say, um, well, I'm, I'm often a, a vocal critic of the international community. There is such thing as international community in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And one of the things that I think is, uh, is, is, is a result of 20 years, uh, over 20 years of trying to kind of fix things in the Balkans um, and the result of overall fatigue with us is the fact that we managed to somehow balkanize the international community and that they often go around institutions. And the deals are made in restaurants, in coffee shops, and so on. Uh, and it's regularly, they have regular press conferences after such lunches and so on. And I think these things undermine the strength of state institutions. Mm. So when you have a national parliament organizing mm -hmm. a committee together yes. with different parties from two entities, uh, besides the findings, the effect is it increases the trust in the institutions. Mm -hmm. It increases the trust in the capacity of the institutions to uh, engage in checks and balances and seeing, uh, and I think it's actually uh, the beginning and the end of a lot of problems in Bosnia and Herzegovina is the judiciary, because it entirely removes the trust in the system uh, by the people because the, the judicial system is captured by, by the nationalist elites and it's used as a tool uh, to get back uh, to your political opponents or to simply trade with favors as a result of their political dealings. So to have a committee, as you said, I, and I love that term, go, you know, deep dive into the into the judicial system and analyze the corruption and the, for people to go on the record and say i was under pressure and i was told to vote this way and i was told to do this in the court or high prosecutorial and judicial council i think it's it's magnificent it's magnificent um and it extend it, the effects extend beyond it however one should not be quick to overestimate um, the effects of it, because we are still living in a, you know, a captured, captured system where the implementation of these recommendations will not unfortunately depend on us. It will depend on political will. It will depend mm -hmm. on election results. And I don't want to be overly optimistic and tell people, look, we have this amazing product and we solved the issue of corruption in the judicial system because we certainly did not. We simply identified it in a formal way uh, we, uh, Damir and, and uh, obviously, I mean, it's the committee's work, but Damir is the, the initiator and the presiding is actually, I, I believe, the author of, of, of the report. Um, the next big question is, can we use it within the Dayton structure and can we use it in the in, in system of uh, uh, kind of state captured by ethnic elites to really truly implement these things? 
which uh, in effect, Damir can obviously say more about it. Um, a lot of it depends on the political will to adopt legislation. Uh, I will remind you that three key pieces of legislation for gaining, for getting candidacy status for the EU were rejected by the nationalist parties, HDZ and SNSD in the House of Peoples after we managed to pass it championed by Nasha Stranka in the House of Representatives and with the support from the, opposi with the, from the opposition in Republika Srpska, still we managed to block this legislation. Um, and the question is, of course, even post-elections, considering the regional aspects of it all and the involvement of Serbia and uh, the role of, of kind of, uh, obviously, Vucic sitting on both chairs with, with Russia and the EU, how will we be able to, even if we get the desired election results, will we be able to independently make decisions in Bosnia and Herzegovina and what will be Washington and Brussels stand in, you know, making sure that decisions about Bosnia are prim primarily made in Bosnia, not in the entire region. Sabina, uh, you, like Tamir, covered a lot of ground there. And I just want to emphasize uh, that, that last point that, that you mentioned is, uh, which I think is uh, something people should really take into account, that even if you surmount these challenges before you, to, in other words, they, they've done this great work, they've uh, diagnosed the problem, they have clear reforms, they re would require uh, political will to, to uh, make the necessary changes to the legislation. And, and what you're saying is, and that obviously you have these major and critical and in some ways very divisive elections coming up, even if all of those things fell into place, even if you had a, a favorable election result to end, end the emergence of some will, maybe the public would get captivated by this and, and excited and, and mobilized, uh, you could still face an obstacle in that you have a neighboring country that uh, Serbia that may not want or, or and apparently does not want the country to be uh, functional in, in that way. So that's, I, I, I think that's just a, a, a very uh, daunting uh, point to, to know about the reality that, that uh, Bosnia Herzegovina is not just uh, subject to the dynamics within the country, but that it's subjected to forces uh, with outside the country. Let me also remind you President Milanovic from Croatia, just yes. to illustrate for our audience how involved, unfortunately, the neighboring states are in the internal affairs of Bosnia and Herzegovina. You have Croatian president who goes on the record saying that if Finland doesn't support yes. uh, election law reform in uh, the, the way that Croatia would dictate it, yes. they would veto Finland from joining NATO. Yes. So uh, that's how openly yes. uh, Bosnian internal affairs are being taunted and being um, essentially uh, threatened yes. um, by the neighboring states. Vucic, of course, is more slick yes. about it. Yes. Um, and, but I think, unfortunately, his policy of sitting on two chairs has worked. Many will disagree. Um, and, and all the statements made, uh, you know, you can't sit on two chairs, which will have to decide. Well, he's not being forced to decide. No, it's been right. how many months since uh, the invasion? More than four months. Uh, more than four months. Yes. Um, initial, I'll remind you that the initial statement he made on neutrality was there was a public statement, press release by the we salute Mr. Yes. Vucic's statement. And then when, when neutrality became too expensive, uh, withdrew. So, so what I'm saying is, uh, despite our assumption that Ukraine changed everything, and we like to start all of our conferences now by saying we woke yes. up in a new reality, everything changed. The big question is, did it really? No. No. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Sabine, I, I couldn't agree more. Let, let me quickly, just in case people uh, just uh, tuned in or uh, opened up the, the event. Uh, my name is Edward Joseph with Johns Hopkins SICE. And I'm here with Sabina Chudic and Damir Aunat. Uh, they are members of par parliament in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Damir is a member of the national parliament and Sabina, member of the federal parliament and uh, discussing this groundbreaking report on the judiciary and on fight the fight against corruption. And Sabina is just mentioning the political dynamics where Bosnia-Herzegovina has two neighbors that uh, have had, uh, going back 
to the war uh, at times uh, different and distinct because Croatia at times was an ally uh, with uh, Bosniaks uh, in the fight against Republic of Srpska and, and at times aligned with Republic of Srpska in an effort to, to actually to destroy the country. Um, and the point you made about President Milanovic of Croatia and President Vucic there, who continues to sit on two chairs, just to quickly note one difference. President Milanovic, of course, has made not just that over-the-top statement about NATO, but has had uh, bigoted remarks about Bosnia. They're highly provocative and insulting remarks about uh, uh, Bosniaks, but we should note one major difference between Croatia and uh, and Serbia. First, Croatia is a member of NATO and the EU. Second, it's led by a prime minister who doesn't make such remarks and who uh, he and his uh, foreign minister have had a, a distinctly different posture uh, towards uh, the country and does not engage in, in this kind of uh, inflammatory rhetoric and uh, over the top uh, and almost, and also irrational uh, behavior. And that's very different in uh, Serbia. You have an autocrat who leads the country and, uh, and decides, and as you correctly say, Sabina is aligned with Russia and has so far um, not only gotten away with it, but been praised even recently, uh, uh, praised for uh, supposedly being on the right track. <clears throat> that that's a, a context for Bosnia Herzegovina. But let's turn back to the to the report. And I, I to, as a way to, to make it easy for you both, let me suggest maybe some uh, issues that we could we could address here. So first, Damir, to come back to you, just to make it real for the people who are uh, watching and. Uh, may not have the, the opportunity to read this uh, very impressive report that I have open here, 113 pages. Uh, give, can you give just what was the, select the most graphic or sensational testimony or information that, that came to light uh, you mentioned obviously that this uh, prior case that which had been public, yeah. but in in the in the uh, terms of the investigation, what, what what can you just something that that is evocative and if anybody can relate to that just sort of illuminates and and, and captures the, this type of work. It's actually really difficult to choose that because there are so many things that were so, <laughs> so shocking that, that we uh, I mean we we pretty much had the idea that the, that the things were so bad. But uh, nobody, none of us, could have imagined that we would have judges and prosecutors from across Bosnia, from all three different ethnic groups, two entities, coming and saying, and I quote, we have hit rock bottom. Things in the judicial sector are irreparable. Uh, these, were, these were extremely uh, disconcerting statements. Uh, when it comes to the specifics, we were told by the members of the judiciary over and over again that you cannot advance in the judicial sector without having strong political connections, that the, uh, that, that the connections between the politicians and the judiciary are rampant. Uh, and then if you want to get into actual specifics, Sabina started uh, talking about it. Uh, we had a senior prosecutor uh, close to retirement age. She kept emphasizing how she can't wait to retire so that she can leave all of this behind her because she's sickened to her stomach. I'm quoting again. And she was a member at, of this high judicial prosecutorial council, a, a 15 member body, which decides among other things, uh, first of all, it decides on all the appointments of every single judge and prosecutor in the country, but also decides on every single disciplinary action taken against all of these judges and prosecutors. And she testified, and this is the only testimony where I, where I didn't uh, feel that any paraphrasing would do justice. Uh, we have two pages of her testimony in the report itself. It, it's a little cumbersome, but, but nonetheless necessary, because she said that she, uh, was told at three o'clock that she needed to rule by 3.30 in a certain disciplinary proceedings against a high member of the judicial sector. Uh, and she was told how to vote. And we stopped her and said, wait, what do you mean? Who told you that? And she said, I wouldn't want to go into names, but I was clearly told how I was expected to vote. 
and uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed that I She's came. a member of the High Judicial Council? She used to be at that, yes, time, at that uh, time, and she's still a prosecutor. And she, I think Explain she's, what is the High Judicial the Council? The High Judicial Council, to put it simply, is an oversight body of the, of, 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 of the entire judiciary in Bosnia and Herzegovina. To make it very specific, they appoint every single judge and prosecutor in Bosnia and Herzegovina. They rule on every single disciplinary action. So in other words, they're uh, the head honcho, if you will, to put it really simply, of the entire judiciary. A woman sitting on that How many body, are 15, 15, 15. They come for from different, country. for the yes. entire country, right. every single, they oversee every single Five board. Of each group uh, right. Not yeah. necessarily, they need to reflect the ethnic makeup yes. of the country. Uh -huh. There are others as well, and so yeah. on. Uh, uh, one third, five are from Republika Srpska, two yes. thirds, ten are from the Federation, okay. following sure. the, the, the basic model. Uh, but uh, the fact is, and this is, this is the incredible part, there are honest people on that body from all three ethnic groups, from both entities. There are corrupt people, likewise, from both entities, three ethnic groups, and so on. Uh, and, and they recognize each other immediately. So this woman was in this uh, honest camp, and she came to us, and she said, look, I'm embarrassed to the core that I came in under pressure, but the pressure was enormous. Uh -huh. And she kept repeating, this, this was really sad, but she kept repeating how she couldn't wait to retire. I mean, we have, uh, my, my dad was a judge in, in Sarajevo, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And, uh, and to me, it was particularly sad to watch a member of this learned profession uh, come to that. Mm. You know, that, that, that mm. pressure of that nature is, is possible, that, that the, uh, the, the prosecutor uh, with entire career behind her uh, cannot wait to go to retirement because of the pressure to, to cave in. Uh, and was, this was there a threat? Was, did she did describe? Uh, I understand. Uh, she she didn't. Uh, she, she, uh, I, I commend her. I commend her from coming before us and speaking so publicly about yeah. it. Uh, we didn't want to pressure her. She was near sure. in tears. Yes. Uh, we also don't have police powers to force her. But uh, we have emphasized this following the release of the report that our judicial authorities, our prosecutorial and police authorities should take a close look into this matter. She said this publicly. Another thing I forgot to mention about this committee was that it was transparent. It was open yeah. to the media. It's Please all transcribed. Uh, it's all transcribed and uh, it's, it, it's all on tape. So, yeah. so it's quite easy to look into it. But look, this, uh, this is why we treat this as a matter of stability and security, yes. because if corruption is rampant in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have state capture, but if it's, if the situation is like this, in the sector that needs to, that is the only capable sector of dealing with corruption, if that sector itself is so corrupt, then, yes. then there's no hope. And, and, and just one thing that you, uh, that you mentioned earlier in reference to, to, to Sabina's uh, speech, uh, that I want to touch upon. Uh, the plan is for this to become a model. The plan is for the opposition, current opposition from RS and, and the Federation to win in October because all of these three main ethnic parties are engaged in corruption, SDAS and SDHDZ. I'm not just making this up. Members of all three ethnic parties are on the sanctions list of the United States. Uh, the plan is for us to win in October. The plan is for us to then make a government on the basis of a program, which would include implementation of these reports, findings, uh, and recommendations, uh, adoption of the three laws required for the EU candidacy, and so on. We do fear we're getting signals that neighboring countries, but also some uh, less than benevolent powers, like Russia, China, and some others, don't want necessarily stability in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and certainly don't want our advancement towards rule of law towards EU membership and so on. We do fear that Vucic will use his power uh, of, of, of different sorts to rein in uh, the partners from Republika Srpska if they want to deal with corruption. Uh, and which is, th this is, this is another thing that we keep repeating, that, uh, that the Western influence in Bosnia and Herzegovina following Russian aggression against Ukraine needs to be increased even further. We're, we're satisfied with what, what we're seeing, but we think that increase, uh, additional increase is necessary. 
And uh, that also includes uh, dealing with uh, uh, de dealing very analytically with certain issues uh, which uh, which might be problematic. I'm, I'm, I'm specifically talking about the Open Balkans initiative that Mr. Vucic is pursuing, which uh, look any regional initiative uh, is good if it's conducive to EU membership. Uh, the Open Balkans. Is, does not seem to be conducive to, to EU membership. And there is an alternative, that's the Berlin process uh, being uh, pursued by, uh, by Germany. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to say that uh, the Open Balkans is not a US policy by any means. And I certainly hope that, uh, that it will not, uh, will not become because that will not be conducive to uh, regional stability. Uh, Damit, uh, I appreciate you putting all of that uh, out there very clearly, again, providing very helpful context here and uh, worth, again, worth restating this, that uh, you would hope uh, that the challenge would be only within your own country. And, right. and that would be a big enough challenge. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. That, that in and of itself would be enormous. You, 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 uh, you, you have to get the public support and, and mobilize, uh, you know, depending on uh, what the composition is of the parliament, and uh, mobilize that. That would be big enough without larger neighbors uh, uh, interfering, uh, seeing this is not in interest. And, and by the way, you're, uh, I, I think you're, of course, you would know better than I, you're right about this and you're right, you know, we see this in your neighbor Montenegro, uh, right. which has a, a golden opportunity to advance to the EU, the best opportunity of any of the six no, countries. One foot in the door. And, uh, and what are they doing? What is the prime minister doing? Uh, carrying out a very strange agenda that uh, seems not to advance Montenegrin's interest to, to get uh, advanced and just uh, make these critical uh, final reforms that they need to. And they, they really do have an open door. Instead, carrying out a divisive agenda over the Serbian Orthodox Church that's only going to distract and divide and protract all of that. So it's uh, what I just mentioned that because that's your bordering neighbor, Montenegro, mm -hmm. and uh, seemingly uh, hostage to mm -hmm. the same type of dynamics that, that you, you would face in there. People sometimes wrongly assume that those are competing visions in the sense that it's a vision between two sides uh, on how Montenegro's future or presence should look like. Um, but actually, in effect, uh, what is going on is that there are two sides of which one desires not their vision of a country, but they desire instability. Yes. They desire insta instability as a goal uh, because there are always powers for whom instability in the Balkans actually pays off. It's not a, you know, Russia and the United States are not competing in the Balkans who should have more cultural centers. There should be a Russian library or American library. No, Russia's interest in the Balkans, it's instability. Yes. Because they need a region. Yes. Uh, what they tried in Montenegro yes. with the, I mean, essentially the attempted a coup, uh, what they tried in Northern Macedonia, uh, what they're doing through Vucic and so on. So what Abaza, which is now doing in Montenegro, it's not just appeasing the, the Orthodox church, but it's essentially, I would say, slowing down the yes. EU process and opening up the space for malign foreign influence. And, and, uh, and again, that would be in your country, which suffered the worst from the war and still remains very divided, uh, that would be uh, extremely serious to have, uh, without that uh, vision to, to uh, advance towards the EU, it's really uh, extremely problematic uh, there in Montenegro, but in Bosnia as well. Um, and uh, Damir, I was uh, interested that you mentioned as well about Open Balkans and uh, how the, a, an initiative that is not uh, conducive to EU membership is, is itself uh, problematic. Um, let me come back to the what you learned uh, there, and this is very graphic. This one, the testimony of the one member of the uh, High Judicial Council. Um, but I'm going to turn to in a second. We'll go from diagnosis to prescription, and we'll we'll, we'll zero in on on how to actually fix this. 
uh, because that's that's critical and that's uh, obviously has relevance in uh, uh, not just in Bosnia, not just in the region, but globally. I mean, this, this again, this is a uh, corruption is uh, a serious problem in many countries, and tackling it and in, in the judiciary is always a, a challenge. So uh, let me come back though before we do that to the the diagnosis. So. Uh, what is it that, uh, wh what is the problem here? Why uh, is it that uh, this entity that's, that's meant to oversee and that has these vast powers over that, including discipline, so that, that immediately comes into the ability to coerce. They, they can coerce any member of the judiciary if they want, if, if you can threaten disciplinary action. Um, and you mentioned it was very intriguing. You said some are honest and some are not. So is it uh, a problem of bad individuals? And if we could only get better individuals, then, then it would be better. Or is it the, uh, the design of this? Is it the, a problem, Damir, of uh, what, what you have in, in any democracy, that you, you have to have, a, you have an oversight body but then you need oversight of the oversight. And you, is it that uh, the ruling parties simply don't, they wanna keep this concealed? What, what, what did you, it, it, out of these 113 pages, first zero in on the diagnosis. What, mm -hmm. what is really the problem? And then we'll come and talk about the prescription. Uh, the problem is really lack of enforcement. In fact, the body itself is one of the most advanced bodies uh, designed ever. Uh, very few countries in Europe, in fact, have it, and it has received high marks when it was set up, and the design itself is not a problem. Uh, it, it's, uh, I, I just want to clarify one thing. Not some are honest, some are not. The, the, what we've seen, really, you know, if we want to talk in percentages, 80, 85 percent, maybe even 90 percent of the members of the judicial sector are actually honest, hardworking people who come to work every day and, and do their job uh, in, a, in, a, in a proper manner. Uh, it's these bad apples, but the fact is you have bad apples in every system. Uh, you know, Bosnia is not, not any particularly interesting case in, with respect to that. But uh, the difference between different countries is whether a system takes care of the bad apples or it doesn't, uh, whether they are allowed to rot and then infect uh, bad a or, or apples around them. And that is precisely what is happening in Bosnia. So it's the lack of enforcement. Uh, and, uh, you know, before we get to enforcement, we need to get rid of the bad apples. So the number one, uh, priority in this report is to do uh, extreme vetting of the top judicial officers basically modeled on the Albanian model. Albania actually had even a bigger problem. They decided that it was absolutely necessary for, for them to vet every single one of the 800 judges uh, and prosecutors that they have in that country. When I say vetting uh, specifically, what is meant by that is complete, complete check of all of their property, all of their assets, uh, complete check on years in, in back, uh, their contacts with political elites, politicians, and also with organized crime. And what happened when they started vetting in, in, in Albania, a large number of these judges and prosecutors chose to resign rather than go through the vetting process. I have no doubt that the same thing would happen in Bosnia and Herzegovina if this is implemented, and it will be implemented if we come to power after October. Uh, we, we have this commitment of, of, of these parties that co collaborated on this report, and the report itself is, is in some ways uh, an election promise, basically. Uh, but uh, the, so, so when you do that vetting, uh, then we also recommend the vetting of people who would come in to replace them. Uh, and then uh, in particular, what we, for, for the long-term solution, what we recommend is severely strengthening or, or, or a big strengthening of the, uh, of the disciplinary office, uh, which is now basically, uh, um, you know, I don't want to go into too many specifics. It's all the specifics are in the report itself. But the disciplinary office right now is weak. Uh, uh, the people are underpaid, overworked. It's only five of them. Uh, and that's something, for example, that the U.S. ambassador talked about at this conference last week, that they really need to be strengthened, their position, and that they need to take action. Uh, without enforcement in any system, you can, you can design a perfect system, but without enforcement, basically, you will not get anywhere. Let me just 
explain that. Who, who, was, who was supposed to enforce what? Uh, you have the Office of the Disciplinary Council, which initiates proceedings uh -huh. against corrupt members of the judiciary. Uh -huh. The High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council then rules on whether there is a disciplinary violation or not. So here we have the Office of the Disciplinary Council, which by all accounts, and the report actually concludes that, is composed of honest people who are not under this corruption. Uh, yet there are only five of them uh, in the whole office, including support staff. Uh, the, the, that they, they cannot do anything. They oversee the work of uh, 1,000 something judges and prosecutors. And we're talking about five people, not all five of them are disciplinary prosecutors. And then even in the instances where they initiated proceedings, they were faced with a body, the corrupt body, the High Judicial Prosecutorial Council, where a member of that council is threatened that she needs to rule in favor uh, of, a, of a certain case. This is also the threats and the, and the pressure that these members of the ODC uh, received were also rampant. Uh, so it's not a systemic failure. The system itself is, that is designed well. It needs to be fixed to a certain extent, but we're not talking about the complete revamping of the system. And then since the system is basically infected by these bad apples, you need to remove them and then you need to ensure that the good ones come in. So it's not easy, but it's completely doable. And one thing which I think is strategically important with me, and, and, and you've been covering Bosnia and, and, and thinking about Bosnia and writing about Bosnia for decades now, and, and you know that this is always a big excuse. Well, we can't do it because of a complex state and structure. That's always an excuse when you don't yes. want to do something. And I heard that excuse with respect to this. And look what happened. We did it. Yes. We diagnosed the problem. We offered the medicine. And now we just need to come to power and implement it because the guys who are in power now actually tried to stop us from doing this. And their excuse would have been, well, you know, it's the complex Dayton system, so there's yes. nothing to be done. Yet sure. all three parties abuse the Dayton system to stay in power and to keep doing corrupt activities. Sure. But no? one, one also ahead. key segment, just a sentence, is how ethnic division is used yes. uh, to justify what goes on in judiciary. Yeah. Because the head of the council, who in the end resigned, is still perceived as essentially a Serb martyr who was unjustly targeted by non-Serbs and so on, despite the fact that it's public fact, knowledge, widely accessible, that when his disciplinary action was initiated, he got a unanimous support, right? That's right. He got That's right. a unanimous right. support after the video came out. That's right. So you have a video of the head of the prosecutorial, high judicial and prosecutorial council engaging in illegal activity and it's his excuse that he's being targeted because sure. he's a Serb, yes. despite the fact that he got the support from Bosniaks, Croats yes. and Serbs on the council. So that's how we, how we use and abuse ethnic prefix yes. to essentially turn ourselves into victims who are targeted uh -huh. not for illegal activities, sure. but for who we ethnically are. Sure. Well, that's, uh... Tremendously important. And then maybe, Sabina, this is the, we'll segue now to the opposite here, mm -hmm. the encouraging uh, cross-ethnic cooperation. Do you want to talk about that? How did that work? This is the opposite of what phenomenon of what mm -hmm. so Sabina is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, target that we have, you know, uh, we have a saying here in our politics, uh, patriotism is the uh, last refuge of the scoundrel. Mm -hmm. right. And so right. in, in, uh, in Bosnia, it's, you know, ethnicity is the, <laughs> is the <laughs> refuge. <laughs> yes, I'm, oh, they're per persecuting me because, you know, this is uh, anti whatever, you know, sort of grow up Bosnia. So can you talk about the, the flip side, the positive mm -hmm. uh, collaboration here across mm -hmm. uh, ethnic lines? Um, sure. I mean, ethnicity is used for, for the best and the worst in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina in, in terms of ethnic prefixes and, and the way we um, kind of my idea is that Bosnia and Herzegovina has always had some form of power sharing, whether formally or informally, and we always had some form of consociationalism. Although the one we have now is so-called the corporate one, incredibly rigid one that essentially permeates every every sphere, every every part of the public sphere, public and private sphere. Um, and how do we move away from that corporate power sharing to more liberal type of power sharing? That's the best part of Bosnia and Herzegovina that we truly did make sure through centuries that there is 
inclusion of all three uh, all three ethnic groups not to mention the others the roma jews and and everybody else and the minorities um and so i'm just gonna that's not what you asked me but i want to start mm -hmm. by with the, with the most negative segment is that this is my fourth year in the federal parliament and i'm witnessing on a daily basis the collaboration between hdz and sda which are the nationalist parties of Bosniak and and Krat, uh, Krat majority parties that um, essentially collaborate in criminal activities incredibly well, incredibly well. Um, at the same time, um, there is obviously uh, we could stay here for days and months. There is obviously we're not going to reach agreement among the ethnic groups in Bosnia and Herzegovina on the nature of the past, but there are certainly enough people in Bosnia and Herzegovina whose commitment to the future is a shared commitment. Any survey, any poll shows the popularity, equal, almost equal popularity of the EU, for example, among all three ethnic groups. And that's remarkable to have people who are perceived as one of the most divided countries in the world to have a joint vision of, of a way forward. Um, and, and, and that's why we are eager for the international community to be a partner in that, to, to kind of recognize that that's essentially particularly for divided societies, the only way forward. Once in, you're in the EU, it stops. I mean, name me a country in the EU that is seriously falling apart. There are none because you're a member of the same family. Um, but I've been really impressed with what the Damir and, and uh, our people in the national parliament, Miriam and Peja, have been doing in the past four years in reaching out across ethnic lines. There was a severe blockade of state institutions uh, last year. And when it was least politically, politically desirable to cooperate across ethnic lines, we reached out to the opposition in the Republic of Srpska. Uh, they were boycotting national parliament. We met in the national parliament. We took joint photos in the national parliament. We issued a joint statement from the national parliament saying, we are committed to the EU path and we are willing to sign even a pre-election statement saying, here are the pieces of legislation that we would pass within the days of the formation of the national parliament after the elections. I understand for many that's modest, but let me remind you of the division currently going on in this country. Uh, I mean, haven't been back in a couple of years. It feels like people within families are not speaking to each other, Democrats and Republicans. and and. Genuinely, it's 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 concerning to see the level of division. So I think even people here can appreciate in a highly divided atmosphere, reaching out and making those agreements and making collaboration possible is a success. Not to mention that people on the ground, there is a really genuinely huge discrepancy in Bosnia and Herzegovina between the elites and the life going on everyday life going on, businesses going on. There are no actually borders within Bosnia and Herzegovina for, for passing from one entity to another. Um, and we are, what we are essentially trying to do is to reflect that reality in politics more, to, to be a greater representation of life going on in Bosnia and Herzegovina and reflecting that life in the political institutions as well. Um, and and in, in that, I am eternal optimist. I genuinely am. We are, I, I just want to remind people who are watching this and maybe are not, uh, that they don't know every single detail about Bosnia and Herzegovina. We are now a country of less than 3 million people. Estimates show about 2.8. Um, that, that's how many people left. So you could practically shake hands with 2.8 million people, essentially, when you think about it in terms of US sizes. So all this complexity that we described today, and all of that, 2.8 million people. I, I think we can turn it around. That's in a, in a very encouraging. Bigger than Belgium or the Netherlands, in fact, uh, size-wise. Then, then, so, so there's plenty of room for everybody. The Netherlands is smaller than mm -hmm. Bosnia. It has 16 million. Operate on these issues that we agree on and that are important for the European future of the country. And uh, listening to Sabina, I think that what people should grasp is how remarkable uh, that is that you were able to achieve this uh, collaboration across the, this uh, entity lines with Republika Srpska. Because why? In the in the political realm, why is that so significant? Because it shows that. 
look, the, your counterparts are politicians like you, your political leaders and politicians, so are they. And so it says that they do not see collaboration with you as fatal to their political interests. And, and if anyone has to know what the Republika Srpska voter will, will sustain or not sustain, it's them. That, that's their, their positions in parliament depend on that. Mm. So they have to know what uh, the, the Serb voter can tolerate. And they, and they see that that, that that is completely tolerable, that, that they, to uh, attain, as you said, a uh, <clears throat> collaboration on a, a future-oriented perspective, let's, you know, not, not immediately touching the, the, these hugely contentious uh, questions, um, but focusing on that uh, uh, shared agenda and the vision for the EU, that's, that's saying a lot. Damir, I, I want to just come and uh, we will, oh, and yeah, we're going to uh, be finishing uh, here soon. Let, let me, if you would just um, describe what it was like working with yeah. and, and mentioned uh, uh, Baranovich and, and your, your counterparts. Uh, yeah. did, this was, uh, you know, completely everyone behaved in, and adopted their roles as um, as members of parliament, right? As Bosnians, yeah. correct? Uh, the, looking out for the interests of the country. Everybody played their role. As I said, I mean, the, the our constitution and our rules of procedure mandate that two thirds of us be from the Federation, one third from Republika Srpska. We kept that balance. My deputy was Dragan Mektic from Republika Srpska. Uh -huh. uh, Branislav Borenovic, uh, also from Banja Luka and his party colleague Mira Pekic, uh, mm -hmm. uh, did, did an excellent job in uh, pursuing certain uh, issues uh, contained mm -hmm. in this report. Uh, everybody had their niche, basically, so, uh -huh. if you will. And then we had we 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 had uh, these members of the federation who all all, all played their role. Uh, but uh, you know, look to to illustrate. I mean, I'll give you numbers. We we had uh, 35 sessions. Uh, the parliament of Bosnia Herzegovina. 35 sessions in two years. The parliament, entire parliament, in four years held 27 sessions. We had 110 votes in this committee, only four abstentions over technical minor issues, you know, nothing substantive, nothing significant. Uh, but I always emphasize, and that's, a, that's something that Sabina also touched upon, this was a local product, completely local product. Uh, there was support from the US embassy, from the OSCE and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but it was on, 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 on a partnership level. And this is what this is what I discovered. This is what the internationals in Bosnia really want. They don't want to be tutors. They really want to have credible partners, capable partners above all, uh, who can tackle these issues which are important to our country. They're, they're primarily important to our country because very often I see jaded international officials who say, look, if you want to be a banana republic, by all means, go ahead. Mm -hmm. The only thing we care about is that there's no war here, that there's yeah. no spillover of refugees. Yes. You want to be a banana republic for the next 20 years, go ahead. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what these quote unquote nationalist leaders have been doing. Because uh -huh. when you mention cooperation, Ed, uh, it's really important to emphasize there's cooperation between parties in Federation and Republika Srpska across the board. The difference is what we did in this committee and what we, how we, what we show that we want to do is do cooperation on the premise of anti-corruption EU membership. These guys want to co continue to cooperate in dividing the spoils, in yes. dividing the board, uh, yes. public board uh, yes. places, in dividing the money that comes in from the IMF every year, yes. and in building villas. So they cooperate also. They, in fact, they yes. cooperate even better yes. because they have one running interest, common interest, which is, okay, you take what's yours, I'll take what's yeah. mine. And, you know, we don't need to yeah. even hold a session of parliament as these numbers show. Yeah. Our cooperation was harder. Yes. You know, okay, I want to hold a session next week, Brian, where can yeah. you come? I can next week. I yes. can do it the week. I, so so yes. th this is harder. Democracy yes. is hard. Yes. That's a, but it's worth it. That, that's a, a, a great point. Uh, Dami, that uh, there's going to be cooperation. Yeah, <laughs> across across the board, yeah. <laughs> you can either have it over the corrupt division of spoils, or you can have it yeah. in a productive endeavor moving the country forward. And and again, it's it's a proof here. It's the the document itself, the votes, all these votes, and yeah. the fact that you pr produced this document. And this is not on some uh, 
side matter, trivial issue. This is on one of the most crucial questions in, in any in any government, any society, uh, the functioning of the judiciary. So that's that's uh, amazing. And we don't have time, uh, unfortunately, to get into some of the, the other questions, you know, the burning political questions there that uh, revolve around the, the representation, achieving legitimate representation under the Dayton framework. We don't have time to discuss those. Congress to share the the yes, program. you're, you're, <laughs> you're uh, meeting members of Congress and, uh, and their staffs, and that's great. Uh, and uh, so let me just uh, thank, uh, before I thank Damir and Sabine, I want to uh, thank all of you for coming. And I want to uh, thank especially, as always, SICE Events uh, for the outstanding work that uh, Brittany and her team and Mo and the IT team do to producing these events. And uh, I want you all to join me in thanking Damir Arnott and Sabina Chudich for coming here, coming to Washington and explaining about the groundbreaking work that uh, they are doing to, in the fight against corruption in Bosnia-Herzegovina. My name is Edward Joseph, and uh, thank you all for joining us online, uh, and have a good day. Bye-bye.